Hey friends, thanks for joining us on the Changed Movement channel. Let's get started. I'm pleased to be here with Melissa Ingram from Arizona. Um, I think we heard recently from Gary um, mm -hmm. and had a chance to chat with Gary online. So just starting, uh, tell us a little bit about your ministry with Gary and then a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much, Elizabeth, for taking the time to talk with me today and work on the technical difficulties. Um, you know, it's so real. Yeah, so Gary and I, I know, I know, especially in today's climate, right? Right. Um, yeah, so Gary and I have been married for 13 years, and when I met him, one of the things that really drew me uh to him was his desire to uh to really start a ministry right to to really equip the church on how to help the majority of christians dealing with some form of sexual or relational brokenness mm -hmm. and at that time i had already clearly felt god calling me to do something similar and so uh, when we, so we started dating and when I finally moved up to upstate New York from the Washington DC area, we began to really speak together and um, you know, on a variety of topics, but um, and really seeking to educate and equip uh, the church. Uh, and yeah, we really enjoy uh, speaking together. We have a lot of fun. Um, it's rare during, you know, that I get to speak with him. Um, often we do the majority of our speaking and ministering together over the summer. Um, but yeah, so we, Love and Truth Network has been around now for maybe five or six years officially. Although again, like I said, we've been, we've been doing that for a while um, prior to that. And what I've been, I was actually reflecting on just kind of like earlier this week about the fact that I was going to be, to be speaking um, to you or speaking with you. And I'm like, what is it? Like I've been sharing my story for close to 20 years. <laughs> you're in our book. Thank you so much for giving us your story for the book. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Right. And, and so, you know, I'm going to be 46 next month. And, and so that means I've been sharing my story since my mid twenties. And I'm so grateful, uh, that, uh, really that the Lord rescued me from such a mess of confusion and hopelessness. And so I thought, what is it? Like, why have I been, what's the most important thing? And I will tell about my story, but what's the most important thing? If I could only share like one thing about the last 20 years um, and, and even prior to that with my story, like what's the most, what's the biggest thing I've learned or what's the most important thing? I think it's that the world cannot offer us anything that will actually satisfy. Yeah, it's good. I, I mean, I ran after relationships. I mean, really, that's, you know, uh, I was looking for the love that I didn't get from, you know, my dad who, you know, my parents' marriage was very troubled. And so he responded to that by staying away. Like he just was not going to confront anything. And, and so he lived kind of a separate life. Um, he was unfaithful to my mom. And I never saw my mother confront him about that. And so I perceived her to be trapped, to be weak, um, somewhat of a victim. I actually saw my father reject her. Um, I, 
in one, at one particular time, I was maybe 12 or 13. And, and I made a decision that I was never going to be like her. Like I never wanted to be financially or emotionally dependent on a man. And yet that's exactly what I wound up doing. Um, you know, I, so in addition to my father's absence, I did find his pornography when I was about that same age in our storeroom. And that was very confusing. Um, and, uh, I was kind of shocked and yet intrigued. Uh, and then my brother was three years older and was sexually abusive in his, his comments about my body. He would grab me inappropriately. And so all of that, plus access to cable TV, this was what, you know, before the internet. And, and so having access to, um, you know, cable channels that really were showing quite explicit sexual material. HBO, um, HBO was show. Yeah, HBO, Cinemax, also known as Skinemax. I mean, that kind of stuff, right? Um, Showtime. And so just not having hours after school without supervision um, really led to an early uh, habit of most masturbation. Um, almost, uh, I wanted to stop, but didn't really know how to do that. Um, no one was talking about it. And then, um, yeah, so I basically acquired this message that uh, women were to be used and abused by men but that was the only way to get love. And so, um, which of course was, was horrible. Uh, it's like, so I've got to participate in something that doesn't feel right, but that's the only way, you know, to, to really be loved. And so, you know, my, I started dating, um, got involved in, in several, you know, long-term relationships, like for high school, like uh, I had a, a relationship of one year, then two years that was into college. And then I was involved in a, in a third long-term relationship where I was engaged. And I basically gave myself away sexually. I didn't know any other way. And so I'm, I'm a sophomore now, I'm engaged. I'm at a private university in, in Washington, DC. I've got everything going for me and I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I would get off the phone with my fiance. I'd be crying because I just missed him so much. And, and in the meantime, I had several different friend groups on college at college. And one was a religious sort of group. Um, I was trying to, to be, to do what I knew to do in terms of, of I'd grown up in a religious family, uh, but we had, I didn't hear anything about a personal relationship with um, Christ. And so I was kind of doing what I knew to do, kind of in my quote unquote faith, um, dead as a doornail spiritually. I didn't know that I was being earnest. Um, and yet there was this split between that crowd. And then I had some other friends who were involved in theater. And it was very, a very progressive, I guess, um, sexually progressive kind of group. And, and all of that led to really questioning my sexuality. Like if I was so miserable with this guy who says he loves me, he wants to get married. I'm, I've got almost a 4.0 at college. I've, I mean, I've got everything going for me. I thought maybe a woman could be, meet my needs. And there was different reasons why that opened, that door was opened. But once that door was opened, I couldn't shut it. I mean, I began to really struggle with my identity. I began to look back at some of my experiences growing up thinking, oh, well, maybe maybe I really always felt this way and I just what, didn't admit it or whatever. Long story short, I met a girl my senior year of college and we became involved and I felt like this is what I've been looking for my whole life. Like I just felt so connected to her and she didn't feel the same way and quickly uh, dropped me um, and went, started dating someone else pretty quickly. And I was devastated. And at the same time, I really was, I was devastated. 
But I also had been searching. I felt like something was missing in my relationship with God. And I'm so grateful for God's grace. Like he, he began drawing me in the midst of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Unlike the relationships, these other relationships with guys, there was something about my relationship with a woman that it really did cause some guilt. It caused some shame. And I knew sort of that it was wrong and yet it felt so right. And so all of that led to this situation where my identical twin sister, who had become a born again believer our freshman year, uh, she invited me to a conference and I was seeking. And so I went and I got saved. I, it was like, awesome. Um, and, the, and the way I got saved was a woman sharing her testimony of, of getting involved with a female friend in a Bible study and then looking at the Bible and saying, okay, what does the Bible say about our relationship? And okay, the Bible clearly prohibits it. And so her friend went off, said, no, I'm gonna do what I want. And the woman that was giving her testimony said, I'm gonna follow God. And she said what changed my life. And this is still so relevant today, yeah. which is just because I felt something didn't make it right. I'm like, what? And that was it. That was what the Holy Spirit used to pierce the deception I had been living under, that, that this was who I was because it felt, quote unquote, so right. And that day I, I confessed my idolatry. I confessed my sin and I got, <laughs> and I got saved, which, which was awesome. Um, I was a senior in college. I was headed into my last semester. My, again, my sister was there, she was excited. And, uh, and I wish I could say that, oh yeah, everything was great after that. But um, as many of you know, who have dealt with um, same-sex attraction, uh, yeah, my thinking had been distorted. The way I was looking at, at men, at women, at certainly, uh, yeah, I was objectifying them. And again, even that piece was, was indicative, I think, of how the pornography and some of that stuff had, had changed my thinking, um, really objectifying others for what they could give me sexually or whatever. And so um, I was a mess when I went back for my senior year of college. I had friends trying to set me up with girls. I'm like, I don't do that anymore. And then I'm thinking, why don't I do that anymore? Like, I, I didn't know anything. And um, anyway, so that was, that was hard. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I did get involved with a campus ministry. That was okay. And then I was off to Brazil to teach English and I had no support. Um, at, you know, at the time there was an Exodus ministry in Brazil, but it was far from me. Brazil's a huge country. Um, and so I kind of just struggled in silence. And it wasn't until I, I came back to the States, I moved back to Washington, DC, and I got involved with a ministry um, that helped people dealing with sexual and relational brokenness that I really began to change I, and, 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 and transform and heal. Yeah. So like all, everything I, I just shared, I could not have explained that to you back then. Yeah. I really yeah. had no idea why I related to people in such broken ways. And I was actually dating a guy, a nice Christian man, and he wanted to marry me. And I'm like, I really like you, but uh, well, hold on a minute. You know, like I just could not emotionally go there. And I'm like, something's really, something's wrong. Um, it's it's broken, and uh, and that was really the impetus I needed to to seek help. And uh, through Living Waters, I really began to to encounter God uh, through prayer, through listening prayer and healing prayer, and through community, right through this safe community of sisters, who I don't even know that anyone else in my small group struggled with same sex attraction. Um, Although they were, the whole group was talking about it, which was so helpful to actually hear other people that were struggling the way I was. Um, but also to realize that, that women 
could there like the outward problem could be different, but our root issues were the same. So I actually wasn't that much different from these other women. I mean, that was so healing. And, um, and so, yeah, basically that started a journey that continues today, which is that, um, you know, basically there's not an option for me, uh, to not be transparent, authentic and accountable especially with regards to sexual sin. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the lifestyle that I've chosen. Um, and yeah, and God has done amazing things, amazing things. We have two boys, 11 and nine. I love them. I love being their mother. Um, I'm able to be present to them in a way that my parents were not, weren't able to be present for me. Gary certainly is able, he's such a good father. And, um, and we've been able to, to pour out to other men and women, right? Who have needed that, that, you know, spiritual mothering and fathering. So anyway, yeah, so, so good, that's my story. You're, you're so good at um, articulating that process and, and, and telling about um, just the way everything transpired. That's so great. What, what were some of the relational issues that you can identify that you had to work through and, and relearn? I think there's a huge, there's a huge process of recognizing what was wrong, but then learning how to relate in, in a healthy way. So yes, can you talk about that some? Yeah. What a great question. Mm -hmm. Um, so first, I really did need to accept myself as a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh, I know. And that's like not easy. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't easy. Um, and it was a process. But if I didn't, if I didn't actually come into agreement with God that I'm not a mistake, like he didn't just, oops, create me a woman instead of a man. Like to actually come into agreement that his intention for me was good. Then I would be, I would be constantly looking for that in other women. Mm -hmm. the, the femininity that I couldn't accept in myself, I would be looking for that in other women. And I'd be sexualizing them. Yeah. And so... A big piece relationally was one, I had to share my struggle with women who didn't struggle like I did, which was so scary. <laughs> like, like one of the women that discipled me. Um, so I, you know, when I got back to DC, I got plugged into a church and a small group. Um, so one was getting involved in a small group that was mixed. It was both men and women. And just like, yeah, like studying the Bible, learning the Bible. Um, but, but finally getting up the courage to tell one or two other women, you know, ever straights, if you will, that, um, yeah, that, hey, you know what I actually struggle with is same-sex attraction. Because I, th I think the fear was that they would think I was attracted to them and they would end the friendship or pull away. And so, but I needed, I needed them to love me, all of me, with my struggles, with my fears, with, with all of that. And so that really opened a process where um, I could be known and, and then what, what that led to, and this is important, and this is, this is mind blowing, but actually I could be intimate emotionally with a woman. Like I could be close to her emotionally and it not be sexual. Yes. What? Yes. Right? And it's like, how do I get there? So like I actually had to push past attractions that I would have for certain women. Like the, the, the solution was not to run. 
but actually to be accountable to a third person who I had no attraction to, right? Um, like a friend, I'm thinking of one friend in particular, she's just a solid believer. And, and so being able to, to say, hey, you know, this is what I'm struggling with or whatever, but then be able to press into the friendship where this stuff was coming up. But once I got past the sexual attraction and even what that was signifying, which is actually, I just wanna be close to this person, then I was actually able to, yeah, just be intimate and, and that not be sexual. I don't know how else to describe it. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, that's so good. I mean, it, I mean our normal instinct is to run away. Mm -hmm. In one way or the other, to not to trust that or to not trust that we can create that friendship right and so you were able to push through that and you said you had three so you had another person to whom you were accountable is that right is that how you said right how did because so how did that work? yeah so um yeah, so I'm thinking, yeah, so I had one friend who, again, didn't, didn't struggle with SSA and was just a good sister in Christ. And so what that would look like is, like, I would talk with her, like, hey, I'm really struggling in this particular relationship. So she would pray for me. She would say, hey, how's that going? And then with the one friend who I was attracted to, I also knew, hey, I do need to set some boundaries. Like we can't be alone together late at night, right? We can't, maybe we need to not spend so much time together. But I just remember that particular friend coming home with me to New Jersey to visit my parents and uh, and they lived close to the Jersey shore. So we went to the beach and whatever. And I just remember praying about that, about that particular friendship. And I don't know, something shifted on that trip wow. where I, I don't, yeah, I just, I just knew that even that we could be close physically again, appropriately, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's silly to put ourselves in a position where anyone would have trouble, you know, not, not acting on those physical desires, but within boundaries, like, because the reality is like, one of my love languages is physical touch. Right. And, uh, my, you know, my sister and I, uh, my mom did not know she was having twins. We were six weeks premature. And so we spent a month in the hospital after we were born. Um, I think we were sick too. And, uh, and so there was a lot of, um, I think, deprivation. And I think my mother was just overwhelmed. I mean, we were, we were tiny. And, um, and I think she was just overwhelmed, <laughs> you know, from then. Uh, but, and my mom is awesome. So it's not, it's not about that. I, she did the best that she knew and the best that she was able to with what she had been given. And, um, and so I recognize that I need touch from healthy women. Like, it's just, that's okay. Um, and that it's not sexual. Um, yeah. So anyway, having that uh, in accountability partner at that time that didn't, yeah, that doesn't struggle the way I do was just helpful in keeping me um, on track. And then, and then that friendship, the one with the woman that I was initially attracted to that eventually just deepened and it wasn't a big deal, that kind of gave me hope for the future. Yeah. Um, for sure. And yeah, so, and, and now I can tell you, I have a handful of just rich friendships with women, um, yeah, that are a blessing to me. I mean, they're just such such an encouragement. So that's definitely one huge thing I think that that women in particular need to know. And then the only other thing I'll say about relational issues is I really had to work through my hatred of men. 
I mean, yeah. And so I speak about this publicly. Absolutely. I'm like, man, yeah. Like I was, I did not like men. I had a very low view of them. Um, and not just that all they wanted was sex, but, but I actually believed that men were stupid, that they were passive. I mean, it was pretty bad. And, um, and so all of that came up as I was in full-time ministry and my boss was a man and like, he was like, he was like bringing all of this up to the surface and I was mad. And so I'm like, what on earth is going on? And so I knew that I was getting triggered. I knew that much. And so I prayed about it. I was like, Oh, well, I actually believe that. Yeah. I believe that at the time my boss was this way, stupid, passive, clueless. Oh, I believe my dad was like that. And then it just like, you know, you just kept going deeper. Right. And it's like, Oh, like I actually had a judgment about all men that all men were boom. And so then I had a choice. And so I renounced that. I was like, you know what, God, I confess that I have believed that I've like categorized half of the population as stupid and clueless. And like, that's a sin. So I've got it. I confess that a sin. And I, I break my agreement with that. Would you show me, you know, how good it is that you've created men in particular? And God has a sense of humor because later that year, it was like right around that time, I think, that I first met Gary. Yeah. And, and that wasn't romantic at all. Like we just were at the same conference and he was a nice guy. We talked a little bit, but that was it. It wasn't until the following year that we began um, to date and stuff like that. But I, I'm sure that he would not have stood a chance through that minefield, right, of, of hatred and anger and resentment and all that if I hadn't worked through that with the Lord. So those were two huge, um, huge victories, you know, in the Lord resurrecting my true self. Those two, those two factors that you're just talking about, how to create healthy relationships with women Mm -hmm. and really how to relate in a healthy way with men are the two points I, I would say they were huge in my life and mm -hmm. I would say those are consistently big issues for women who struggle with same-sex desire like even I, I was just having a conversation with a couple of friends yesterday just even trying to understand what does it look like to have a healthy relationship with a woman how can I trust that this right now is healthy with the friends that I know I'm just navigating that how, am is this going to become codependent or is this safe mm -hmm. you know just navigating that realm and then walking through so many women have been abused by men mm -hmm. and um, they've either, either like you observed it or experienced it or both and and so navigating the judgments that we create is so important mm -hmm. yes and what was helpful for me was seeing men so serving with men on a leadership team who were like particularly living waters where they were men who who were there because they, they admitted they were broken sexually, relationally, and they were pursuing Christ. And so actually serving with them, having them pray for me, having them bless me, like was life changing. And then me being able to bless them, like pray for them, intercede for them. Uh, that, was, that was huge, that was huge. Um, so yeah, doing the work with, between me and God with help, um, and then also being around men who were pursuing the Lord was so, so healing to me. That's so right. I mean, really relationship heals relationship. Yes. You know, healthy relationship creates healthy relationship. And identity. I mean, we learn our identity based on the people around us. Right. And, and even we're shaped by the people who are around us. And so, wow. Well, that might be a good place to end on. Do you think you could kind of pray over 
over those who are listening right now? We can just release and sure. Yeah, all of us, including me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Father, I do just want to thank you so much for this time with Elizabeth, God, and the, the changed community. Father, we desperately need you um, to continue to pour out your love, your healing, your, um, your strength, that covering that we need. Um, Lord, as a father, we just need you in that way. And, and I do want to speak just a blessing over every person listening that you would pour out your supernatural favor, your power upon them, your affirmation, that even as I'm speaking, that you would call forth more of their true self, the man or the woman that you've created them to be. And we do just stand together against the enemy where he would seek to steal, kill, or destroy what you would have for each one. And we give you all of the glory, like you are awesome. And uh, we look forward to seeing how you're going to continue to use um, the change movement to impact the world uh, for your son, Jesus. Amen. And thank you. And we just bless you. We bless you and Gary and your kids and your ministry. Thank you. Your callings. Gosh such an, a key ministry at a vital time in our generation. And so um, we bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, if someone wanted to reach you or, or love and truth, how would, how would they do that? Yeah, probably the best way would be through our ministry website, which is loveandtruthnetwork.com. And love and the ampersand, or is it love A-N-D? A-N-D. Okay. Love yeah. So the website is love and the word truth network, um, dot com. Yeah. That'd be great. We look forward to hear from them. Very cool. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks for watching. For more info, head over to our website, listen to our podcast or find us on social media. And remember changed is possible. <laughs>